All right, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Ebba Siegelberg, Senior Associate Dean and Chief of Staff in Arts and Sciences, and I am delighted to welcome you to the inaugural Dean's Distinguished Lecture. In a few moments, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Carl Phillips, Pulitzer Prize winning poet and professor of English here at Washington University, who will speak on pressure against emptiness, some thoughts on making. After Carl's presentation, we'll have some time for questions from audience members. And then following that, we hope you will stay and join us for a reception uh, in the foyer, sort of to my left over in that cafe area. Uh, but now it's my honor to introduce our Dean and the host of uh, today's event, Feng Sheng Hu, the Richard G. Engelsman Dean of Arts and Sciences and Lucille P. Markey Distinguished Professor in Biology and Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. Something you may not know about Dean Hu is that as a scholar, he is widely recognized for his innovative research on long-term ecosystem dynamics in relation to climate change. In addition to his many publications and grants, he has received scholarly accolades, such as being named a Packard Fellow in Science and Engineering, a Fulbright Scholar, and a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He also has a long history of academic leadership. Prior to his appointment at Washington University, who, uh, Dean Hu was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for many years, where he served in a number of leadership positions at the university, including as the Harry E. Preble Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Since arriving at WashU during the height of the COVID pandemic in July 2020, Dean Hu has focused on implementing a bold strategic plan for the future of arts and sciences. Since the plan's launch, Arts and Sciences has recruited a large number of outstanding scholars to join its faculty, set a record for external grant funding, and developed signature initiatives to spark convergent and innovative breakthroughs in research and education, ensuring the vibrant growth of the school for many years to come. I would now like to invite Dean Hu to the podium to introduce today's speaker. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Eba, for the very kind introduction. And good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for what is sure to be an inspiring presentation today. I am delighted to welcome all of you to the inaugural Dean's Distinguished Lecture in Arts and Sciences. This lecture series is an opportunity to come together as a campus community to hear from some of our brightest minds in arts and sciences. I anticipate this to be the first of several exciting lectures taking place in the coming year as we share the insights and expertise of our accomplished faculty. As many of you know, we are now two years into the decade of arts and sciences, a period of incredible growth that will establish our school as a global model of research, education, and scholarship. This undeniable momentum across campus as our faculty, staff, and leaders work together to bring this bold vision to life. A key component of this plan involves bringing our talented faculty into the spotlight to showcase their scholarship, teaching, and public impact. It's fitting then that we start this lecture series with professor of creative writing, Carl Phillips. Carl is a celebrated poet, essayist, and professor whose work has garnered critical acclaim and captivated readers around the world with numerous accolades to his name. He's considered one of the most influential voices in contemporary literature. Here at Washington University, he's held in equally high esteem for his teaching and mentorship. How is the author of more than 15 books, including Then the War and Selected Poems 2007 to 2020? This incredible collection was recognized with the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry in 2023. 
in honor that places Cao among a small handful of Huaxiu faculty to have received the prize. While his Pulitzer is indeed a remarkable honor, Cao has a long history of prize-winning poetry. In 1992, his first book, In the Blood, won the Samuel French Morse Poetry Prize and put him on the map as an outstanding newcomer in the field of contemporary poetry. His 2001 collection, The Tether, won the Kinsley Tufts Poetry Award, and 10 years later, Double Shadow received the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. A finalist for both the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award, Kao's other honors include the Lambda Literary Award and Award in Literature, from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the, uh, the Library of Congress. For six years, Cao also served as chancellor of the Academy of American Poetry, American Poets. Given the significant, the significant recognition, it might surprise you to learn that as an undergrad at Harvard University, Cao initially wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> what a huge difference there. His career path later evolved to teaching high school Latin, a job that cultivated his love of teaching and allowed him to begin writing poetry. He arrived at Washington University in 1993 for what was slated to be a three-year teaching job. Fortunately for all of us, his time in the Department of English was vastly exceeded to 30 years. So he's been at Washu for 30 years. He has served as a professor and director of Washu's writing program, roles that have allowed him to support countless students and professionals setting out on their own paths to poetry. I encourage you to learn more about Kyle's inspiring journey to writing and teaching in our latest issue of Ampersand magazine. I was personally moved to read his reflections on the power of poetry and the ways his writing and mentorship have influenced so many around him. I know his presentation today will be equally captivating so now, please join me in welcoming Professor Carl Phillips. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Hu, for uh, the introduction. Um, I learned right before this that I could actually the dean said, oh, I assume whatever you're going to say, you've read this many times. It's like, no, I thought I had to write an original thing, <laughs> which is what I did. So thanks. Uh, but anyway, I'm very honored to, to be the inaugural person doing this um, for the dean's distinguished lecture series. I hope, hope I will... Um, do it proud. Um, thank you, Dean Hu, for inviting me. Thank you, Sarah Lou England and Aaron Lewis in the Dean's office for all of your help getting this all together and um, your patience organizing me. Um, and although I just met Jessica and Janet, um, thank you too. Apparently you also have been doing lots of work behind the scenes. I didn't know that. So I appreciate it. Uh, all right. <clears throat> um, is this fine, this mic? Thing. Okay, I guess we're going to get started. Uh, the, um, so I changed the title a little bit, but not enough that's really going to make a difference. Now it's called Pressure Against Emptiness on Making, Being Made, and What is Made. I'm not sure what the difference is there, but I felt it was more thorough and precise. So the charge, as in the Dean's assignment, the charge was to inspire by sketching out a trajectory of my life by which was meant, I think, my career, though they are not the same. They've merely come here and there into contact with one another, more briefly at some points than at others when they touched at all. 
The problem with speaking about my life is it means constructing an order of events as remembered, the work in different ways of the biographer or memoirist, an arrangement of events as remembered in a way that makes most sense to the one remembering. But making sense doesn't make a thing true. <clears throat> to arrange an order of events into isn't necessarily to report the order in which things actually occurred. As for what makes sense to the rememberer, sense tends to make mean what satisfies, gives pleasure. Adversity in our lives doesn't feel good. We do not like it. We say it makes no sense. Likewise, we prefer not to see ourselves in a bad light as bad people. If we behaved terribly, we look at once for the conditions, the people who forced us to behave as we did, to step away from our good selves. I've learned the hard way not to trust memory's soft edges. As the poet Kathleen Graber puts it in her poetic sequence, The Letters, a mnemonic for forgetting, what has happened unhappens, and we rewrite it. We assemble that version we think we can bear. Then there's the problem of speaking about career. For me, career may contain the accidental. The random accident of luck is always part of it. But career is mostly intentional. Most of the students I've taught in an MFA program have had the intention of being not just poets, but poets with published books, books they hope will win them the recognition in the form of prizes, reviews, that will secure them some stability, money, a loyal publisher, a job that will afford them large swaths of time in which to write more books. I get that. And there's nothing especially wrong with it. But I never intended to be a poet as a career. I didn't know that was possible. I didn't have the luxury of knowing it. Since when I did start writing poems as an adult, I felt I was writing quite literally to survive. More than once, I've tried explaining this to large groups of people I'll never know, and to friends I do know. No one ever believes me. I love how closely the Latin word behind the word career, carus, a wooden cart with wheels, resembles the Latin for chariot, curus. A chariot drawn by horses provided swift movement in combat initially, and then for daily transportation, usually by royalty or at least the wealthy. It's where we get the word current, as in a river's current, or current events, things propulsively ongoing. In hindsight, this is what a career can look like, inevitability, even destiny, one chapter leading naturally to the next one until to ask, how did I get here, seems absurd or naive or like false modesty. But career comes from carus, a modest cart, reliably sturdy for carrying goods rather than people. A cart is less about combat or idle privilege than about daily utility. There's no glamor or drama to it. It's more like most lives. A career is more how we carried ourselves incidentally across and through. A career in poetry, as in any art, means a life spent making Making objects, yes, but also making as in making a way forward within irresolvable conundrum. It's an urge to understand, if not resolve, to make a space of rest, of apparent knowing, within a larger restlessness of living consciously as a human being with a body in time. Maybe each poem is its own little cart, carrying its particular necessary load of apparent knowing across what ultimately can't be known, not entirely. I love how metaphor in modern Greek means truck. Sometimes I think all I've made, all the poems, all the decisions and intentions, good and bad, amount to a four-pointed throwing star, an X of love, death, making, and emptiness. A star is not a compass. What use can a compass be this late? And as if not being lost had ever been the point anyway. A star is not a compass. But in my darkest nights, it has given me a light to see by. No ordinary star. A throwing star. Here. Catch. It says drink water. And I was right. I would want to drink water. <laughs> 
It was a guess, but. All right. The title of this talk is entirely indebted to the title of Linda Gregg's poem. Here's her poem, Pressure Against Emptiness. Did it magically appear? Yes. Thank you, Aaron. I was told all I had to do was use the clicker or this, do something on the screen, and I said, I don't, I don't trust myself. So someone is clicking for me. Apollo's left fist covers his heart. His eyes are holes. He used to shine, but time has darkened him. His bronze thighs are covered with words. He is waist deep in language. I see wheat, lost teacher, tree darkness, goat, mountain, river, tree in a field. Was he merged with life? Was he ripeness holding still? Did he say, this is my body, eat me? Was he strength made out of pity? He has the pierced blank look of love, knowing we die as flowers do, and it makes a difference, a pressure against emptiness. Did they know him? Did the shining change their bones? At night, they knew the grass by touch. When day began to end, they heard owls away in the fields and within their bodies. Apollo's left fist covers his heart. The fist of potential violence or gift, both maybe. Heart as in love, in poetic tradition at least, but also as in no life without one, no human life. Apollo was a god. Did he have a heart? Can a question like that matter if we believe in gods or we pretend we do until it's true within that space of believability I call the poem's force field? Is he covering his heart to shield it? Is the pressure of fist on heart an example of the pressure meant in the poem's title and the heart and emptiness, the way his eyes are reduced to holes even as the bronze of, it, of his thighs has been reduced to language or overwhelmed by it? for he is waist deep in language. Am I not myself waist deep in language, even as I write this? For me, Greg's poem speaks to the idea of making art and of what becomes of the made thing once the maker's gone. Here, the sculpture of Apollo becomes the resonant catalyst, not for resolution, but for questions and speculation. We see the physical statue clearly enough, but we're left to wonder what it means, what it meant to others whom we'll never know. Did the statue, statue's shining change their bones? Apollo being a god and gods being abstract and insubstantial, we only have faith as proof of their existence. But to make a statue depicting our, our idea of what, what we can't see might look like if we could see it, is to resist the emptiness of abstraction, to offer pressure against it, which is to say art itself is a pressure against emptiness, as, in, as is our impulse to make art. To quote myself, it's a human need to give to shapelessness a form. Back to Apollo. He has the pierced blank look of love, knowing we die as flowers do, and it makes a difference a pressure against emptiness. Hard to parse exactly what's meant here. Is it our dying that makes a difference? Or Apollo's knowing that we die? Or the blank look of love with which he knows this? I lean toward the first option. Death would seem to be a form of emptiness, but the fact of our dying bodies is proof that we had bodies built to die. Our living, our existence, is the active pressure against non-existence. But our dying is a kind of proof of that, the way we more consciously acknowledge bird song, it seems, in winter when it disappears. We know the emptiness of the air by our memory of what daily filled it. It's as if the disappearance were necessary, itself a catalyst for the still living to remember what lives no longer. Remembering, too, is a pressure, of course against the emptiness of forgetting. In Greg's poem, the made thing, the statue of Apollo, is a means of remembering not just the otherwise forgotten maker of the statue, 
but the people to whom the statue meant something in particular. Not just those people, but the otherwise lost world that once contained them. Art, as the concrete remnant of a lost world, provides a re-entry point to that world that we ourselves keep from being lost entirely by our human powers of speculation and imagination. We can't ever know the people who lived there, what they hoped for, how they suffered and rejoiced, but we can wonder about them, and in our wondering, keep them somehow alive. Art is a pressure against the particular death of having been forgotten. As I understand it, this is part of why many artists make art at all, to say, I was here, remember me, a bit like why some people have children. Death is one thing, to be forgotten is something worse, apparently. Do I myself make art in order not to be forgotten? No, or I don't think so. Yes, I believe the questions that hover around art keep the art alive, and by extension, its maker's particular sensibility, what remains beside the emptiness of their own disappearance. But that's not why I make poems, not as a guarantee of immortality. I'm not sure I believe in that, despite Shakespeare's insistence to the young man whom he addresses in Sonnet 60. And yet, to times in hope, my verse shall stand, praising thy worth, despite his cruel hand, namely death's cruel hand. The poem still exists, but the young man is long dead. We could say he's alive in so far as we are made to think about him each time we read the poem, but I still don't know this man, how he moved in the world, how he felt about it, how it felt to share space with his living body. What's immortalized is one individual's human impulse to prevent a beloved from being erased by death. Shakespeare's dead. So is the young man, whoever he was. The human reaction against death is ongoing so long as humans exist in the world. That reaction, that impulse, is to this extent immortalized in Shakespeare's poem. That's not nothing. We die as flowers do and it makes a difference. But that's not immortality for the maker or his beloved. Usually I tell people that I write because I can't not write. It's just a thing I do, that I seem to have to do, for some reason that I don't spend time trying to know. It's related to how I write, rarely with a clear subject in mind, or if there is a subject, then I have no sense of how I want to approach or develop it. Instead, I give in to unknowing within which, with luck, no guarantees, a way forward will be shown to me, though I'll only see any of that in hindsight. But part of why I'm speaking here today is to address the reasons for making, and I've agreed to cooperate. In which case, I think I write poems as temporary counterweights to mystery. To be clear, I adore mystery. Should it come to winnowing my addictions, as I once put it, I'd hold on hardest, I'm pretty sure, to mystery. But too much mystery, or too much consciousness of it, can overwhelm. Poems allow me to live at once inside and alongside mystery without becoming overwhelmed by it. As I said, this is temporary. This temporariness, I think, is why I write the next poem. Sometimes I think it's like having rescued a damaged dog, now figuring a way to make a life with it, knowing some part of the dog will always, to some degree, remain feral. Sometimes I'm able to recognize, I'm briefly willing to, that the feral dog has always been myself, still is. I used to put it another way. I used to say writing was how I put temporary space between myself and the seemingly unbearable. That's more dramatic than calling it a counterweight to mystery, but ultimately less accurate. Or it was accurate, but only at the start. When I began writing poems I could call my own, some of which would become my first book, though I couldn't have known that, never having thought to write a book. 
I'd written poems before in college, but they were really just imitations of Sylvia Plath's poems, except I wasn't Sylvia Plath. Her life wasn't mine. I was just trying to inhabit one manifestation of her life, her art. Art and life aren't the same. I didn't understand my own life enough yet to be able to write from it. Some part of me seems to have known this. I stopped writing. I did not miss it. The same week that I received my teaching degree, ready to begin my career as a high school Latin teacher, I got married to my best friend from college, a woman whom I genuinely loved based on everything I knew then of love and its possibilities and not understanding that I was gay. Yes, there had been that man in college, but, but that wasn't love. That was, stop. Periodically, maybe once every four or five months, in those early years of marriage, I'd be possessed, that's how I put it, by an urge, a sexual one. And to deal with it, I'd drive out of town to find a gay porn magazine, which I'd immediately after get rid of, in part so there'd be no evidence, and in part because afterwards I was so repulsed by my own sexual attraction to other men, so repulsed that I easily suppressed again the urge itself, and for a few months more, my life returned to normal. I was almost 30, a loyal husband, a so-called pillar of my community. A loyal husband because masturbation to a gay porn magazine didn't count, did it? If it didn't last, if it was just sex, and for the moment, if it wasn't love. Looking back, I see the glimmers right then and there of moral flexibility that would come to define my early poems and of the moral inquiry that still characterizes my work today. But back then, it was just a way to justify what I didn't want to understand about myself, what I wasn't yet ready or able to understand at the time. For no apparent reason, I started writing again. I wrote poems that, for the first time, both surprised and frightened me, which is to say, I began writing real poems, my own. Here's one from that time, for Chiron. There it is, it's magic. Nothing expected hurts as it otherwise should. So no, you did not hurt, Professor, even that first time. I had dreamed already the green line of subway before your directions, your shadow, a tall drink in a room of skyline rising off glass surfaces, everywhere glass. That much I saw before seeing the incidental angle to your bed, traveling wet with clues among well-suited men on the train in daylight, showering you into the loose tiles of the dormitory bathroom. All as expected, half note of surprise to every return, my dim passing away from you, the clouds I watch now in June, broad years from you, waiting for your shape to drop on a life I make for myself. I like to think of me moving across that part of your life where you somewhere lie remembering, though this is the one thing I never expect, but still bewilders each time you wake to it, lifting yourself to different faces. I mentioned earlier a man from college. I met him when working summers as a shuttle bus driver for biologists and their families at the Marine Biological Laboratories in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He was a biologist who taught at Harvard, where I was an undergraduate, a scholarship student who'd just moved up from cleaning dormitory toilets to managing the front desk at the Harvard Faculty Club. He suggested that I visit him at his condo sometime. I kept the address and number all summer, and maybe a semester into the new year, I gave in to the urge to call him I'm pretty sure I'd been drinking already when I took the subway over, and when I arrived I was offered more to drink, plus marijuana, which I was fairly new to. Eventually I passed out, I guess. When I woke, I was being raped, 
though I didn't call it that, nor did I try to make it stop. Rod Stewart was playing. I woke again in a man's arms. I left in the morning without showering, though once I returned to my dorm, I thought I'd never stop showering. I'd never be clean of what had happened, what I'd let happen, what I'd somehow known would happen and wanted. Is that why I got married? As a way to clean myself? To free myself from the possibility that I wanted to have sex with men? Oh, I hope not. I don't want to believe that. I won't believe it. I'd forgotten all about that incident with the professor when I wrote for Chiron. Not forgotten, apparently. Compartmentalized. And in writing the poem, I made a new compartment for the incident, one that instead of keeping the incident hidden, put it front and center for me to see, now that I was ready to see it. Here was a poem that, as I said earlier, surprised and frightened me. The surprise of memory, the fear of recognition, of admission that I'd not been completely naive, that I'd known what I wanted, that I'd returned for more, at least twice that I can remember, and that even now, six or so years into my marriage, I was wondering if I'd at least left an impression on this man's memory. The poem feels nostalgic. There's a sense of longing to it, even as the speaker also has a vaguely sinister, cool detachment from the whole business of an older professor drugging and raping an undergraduate too young and inexperienced to understand consent, power dynamics, or his own identity in general, let alone his sexual identity. Maybe most disturbing to me about this poem is the title I gave it. Chiron was the centaur, half man, half horse, who served as teacher to the Greek hero Achilles the hero whose grief over the death of his friend Patroclus has led many classical scholars to suggest a homoerotic relationship between the two heroes. Chiron then is associated both with the Greek heroic tradition and more distantly, the homoerotic. Centaurs are also notorious in mythology for their lustiness. The human part of the centaur, the head and chest, understands self-control and reason, but the horse part, from the waist down is wild, pure instinct. And it was the centaurs who famously crashed the wedding of Pirithous and Hippodamia and tried to rape the bride. The direct address to the professor from my past, combined with the dedication in the poem's title to Chiron, equates Chiron with the professor. And in doing so, it equates the latter with classical tradition, which has a way of elevating the ordinary by dipping it in the amber of timelessness, gravitas, and artistic excellence. It has a glamorizing effect that can distract from the truth the way art itself can. What is mythology if not a pressure against emptiness, the art of story making pitched against the otherwise inexplicable mystery of human, which is finally animal, behavior, including violence and erotic desire? I say art can distract from the truth by not, rep by not representing a thing as it actually is, but art simultaneously contains the truth in a form that enables us not to resolve but to coexist with it. That's not distraction. It's a kind of mercy, I think. More exactly, art allows proximity to the truth, perspective. We can imagine a relationship to the truth we feel a little more ready to trust that it won't hurt us now. We're almost willing to touch it. Closer. I've spoken of writing as a way to put space between myself and the seemingly unbearable. In those early days of writing poems, the seemingly unbearable was my queerness. My poems knew that, even if I didn't at the time, not clearly. It felt to me like I was making up stories or overhearing parts of them and writing that down. But with each poem, I realize now, I was constructing a world within which and a language with which 
a crucial part of myself could find voice and make space for itself, a space unavailable in my more immediate world or in the language spoken there. I've often said that my first book outed me. Another version is that in the poems of that first book, my queerness found fluency and sang back to me until at last I could hear it, until I wanted to, because if there was bitterness, hard truth, there was also sweet. I don't know exactly what the alternative would have been, but it's in this context that I'm speaking when I say I believe I wrote those poems in order quite literally to survive. Where in any of this does career figure? A career as a poet? That would be like having to speak of my career as a human being. One of the many problems with aligning artistic creativity with academia's hierarchical structure, I speak as someone who has directed a graduate writing program and taught in one for quite some time, is that it implies a codified system to art, a version, if you will, of pressure against emptiness. It seeks to quantify abstraction with concrete evidence, a review, a fellowship, publication, proof of value in the outside world, value which then redounds upon the university itself, both bolstering its reputation and confirming its wisdom in having committed to, gambled on, from the start, the artist in question. This system relies on equating the figurative with the literal. To make a career as a poet is to be a poet, the system says. I disagree. Here's a poem I wrote one night while meaning to write more of this talk. It hasn't got a title. That'll take a while, but I'm pretty sure it's a poem. I say it is, and the poem itself hasn't yet said otherwise. We lay down fully clothed, next to, but not touching, like two heroes, each known to the other only by hearsay, each refusing to show too soon his respective powers. I liked that. I liked thinking in a world where almost nothing anymore stays hidden, that secrets still had their place to be defended, should it come to that. Did you know, he said, that the first fireworks were likely the small fires people lit, not for warmth for once, but for distraction, to catch, then sustain the gods' attention while wishing, let this befall, or by some miracle, become unbefallen? There's this lullaby I was taught to sing long ago when frightened. Like waves, the context keeps changing. The suffering's the same, like the ocean is how it goes. I still sing it sometimes in my head. No, I said, turning to him, not touching him not needing to. No, I've never known that till now. The people here are apparent strangers getting to know one another. There's an erotic charge, it seems, between them, reinforced by how the erotic is notably avoided. Twice we're told they didn't touch, and from the start that they're fully clothed, a kind of suggesting that what isn't happening by implying what might. One brings up an origin story about fireworks. Does the other know about this? The other remembers a lullaby he learned as a spell against fear before answering that he didn't know the fireworks story, but now he does. I often tell my students that most lyric poems, when broken down to their bare narratives, aren't all that interesting and or new. And this poem is no exception. What matters more for me is not the information laid out in the poem, what we might call the poem's solidity, but the questions that emerge, the resonance in between and around those blocks of information that we call stanzas. Is it true, this story about the fireworks? I'm pretty sure I made it up while waking to fireworks this most recent New Year's. I'd gone to bed early New Year's Eve, and when the fireworks began, this story came to mind, and. Just before falling asleep again, I thought to write it down, 
knowing I'd lose it otherwise by morning. I've since tried to track down the story, thinking I might have read it somewhere else before, but I don't think so. I made it up, which doesn't make it true, but it's not implausible. Does that count as truth in the poem? What about the lullaby? That was originally a handful of lines that I wanted to believe was a poem, written in response to various situations in different parts of the world last year and now, the Congo, Palestine, Ukraine. Was this handful of words enough for a poem, I kept asking, and my having to ask meant the answer was no. What made me repackage them, though, as a lullaby in this very different poem? And what lullabies include words like context and suffering? An adult lullaby, maybe, yet we're told it was learned long ago. Until now, our heroes have only known each other by hearsay. By the poem's end, one man knows something because another man has told it to him, hearsay. The information may or may not be true, in which case, what is meant by knowing? What is meant by story? Can a lullaby be story? Can the reverse be true? What is meant by true? And what's the relationship between the two heroes? How did they get here and why? When the one says at the end that he's never known that till now, it seems he refers to the story he's just been told. But could he also mean he's never known what it's like not to have to touch a stranger? not touching him, not needing to. If art is a made form of pressure against emptiness, of concreteness against abstraction, of orientation in the form of pattern, in this case, patterned language, as counterweight to the disorientation of mystery and its languagelessness, if a poem is a momentary stay against confusion, as Frost has put it, then what seems to happen in our putting to rest, even briefly, our empirical restlessness, our quest to know, to penetrate conundrum, is that further questions begin emerging, further emptinesses. It's as if, in pinning down mystery, or at least thinking we have, we've also made a hole in it, so that a little leaks out. We've held mystery in place. We haven't stopped it from breathing. That's a good thing. The trouble with most poems, in my experience, is that if they breathe at all, they soon stop breathing. We human beings are the ones who must each eventually stop breathing. Not the mystery for which we have no better words, it seems, than emptiness, open-endedness, conundrum. Little firework that a poem can be small fire made of kindling thoughts, the mind's driftwood, that our small personal light might catch the attention of whom? Those gods whom the ancients believed in departed long ago from the field of belief. Just the night sky and beneath it, just ourselves, little gods of making, making against our inevitable unmaking to each a separate fire for company, a flame to distract ourselves with, if no one else, warmth against the threat of cold, of loneliness. We may well be the last gods left. When the emperor in ancient Rome had returned victorious from war or battle, a triumph was held, the equivalent more or less of our modern victory lap, in a chariot through the streets of Rome. Auriga, is the Latin word for the chariot's driver, whose other task was to routinely whisper two phrases in the victor's ear. Memento mori, remember you're mortal, and memento homo, remember you're a human being, lest the victor lose perspective and become too reckless with his power. Like that driver, my partner now and then reminds me that despite the earmarks of achievement available in the writing life, publication, prizes, etc. No one is special, myself included. And I agree entirely. There is no best, despite all the anthologies with that word attached to them. So much is random, 
almost everything, including the randomness of where and when we're born and to whom, and the opportunities or lack of them that have, have everything to do with place and timing. Talent is everywhere and arbitrary, and much of it will never get noticed. Luck is a real thing. Maybe more importantly, so is kindness. When Carrie Saunders, the black woman who was also head of guidance at my high school, cornered me in the hall in senior year and demanded to know if I was applying to Harvard, when I told her no, I'd heard of Harvard, but I'd assumed I couldn't get in, and that if I did, my parents couldn't afford it, they hadn't gone to college themselves, we knew nothing about scholarships. When she dragged me then and there to my own guidance counselor and demanded to know why he hadn't insisted on my applying, when she personally saw to it that I did apply, she was doing her job on one hand, but she didn't have to notice me. She didn't have to be committed to seeking out minority talent. She believed in me. She was kind, as was the classics professor at Harvard who, when I said I was unsure what to do after graduation, suggested I make a good high school teacher, something I'd never considered, being terrified of public speaking and recommended a then new MAT program at the University of Massachusetts that specifically trained and certified people to teach Latin in public high schools. One day, while teaching my beginning Latin class, I learned that a poet, Martin Espada, would be visiting the school for the day, and he offered a mini workshop after school for any interested teachers. I'd just begun writing again. I had no idea what a workshop was, but I signed up, Martine had us write for 20 minutes, then share what we'd written. At the end of the session, he pulled me aside and said, I seemed to be an actual poet. Had I thought to apply for a state grant? No, I'd never heard of that. Martine told me how to apply. He didn't have to. I sent some poems with an application and had pretty much forgotten about it until a letter arrived, maybe six months later, saying I'd been awarded $10,000. I used the money to buy a computer and to take summer workshops from a poet, Alan Dugan, who was teaching not far from where I lived. Dugan is the one who suggested I compile a manuscript. I'd never thought to do so. He's also the one who vouched for my sanity after I'd driven to the poet Robert Pinsky's house with a manuscript and asked to attend his workshops at Boston University. I should mention that I'd never have done such a thing if my then partner, who knew nothing about poetry, but believed in me anyway, hadn't come up with the idea and driven me himself to Pinsky's house. It was Pinsky who told me of a visiting poet job at some place I'd never heard of in St. Louis. It would only be for three years, I thought. Why not try? And it was the kindness and belief of a handful of faculty members here in particular, Dan Shea, Naomi Lebowitz, Wayne Fields, John Morris, that led them to believe to change my job to tenure track after my first year here, and in my third year, to put me up for tenure. That's almost 30 years ago now, 20 books ago, many accolades and many more students ago. No one is special. Most people deserve kindness. Many never receive it. I try to remind myself about this each day and to act accordingly. I woke this morning thinking of that poem of mine that I shared earlier, the one with the lullaby, the fireworks story, the two men not touching while lying beside each other. I'm not sure yet, but I'm thinking I've got a title finally. I think I'll call it Gratitude. Thank you. So I just stand up here? Okay. So I'm supposed to stand here and, and you're supposed to ask questions or something? Or you don't have to, we could just drink wine, whatever. <laughs> ask anything, obviously I, I'm willing to talk about anything. <clears throat> they might just want to drink. I 
I'm going to escape. Oh, I haven't escaped. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your, both your candor and um, and candidly for your vulnerability too, because I think to um, to write and to share in the way that um, you have here um, takes an extraordinary amount of that as well. And so I, uh, the question I had really was about the the start of the talk when you started talking about sense making. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how you think about um, sense making against, or do you think about sense making against the backdrop of an imagined audience, um, an imagined audience full of people with certain societal ideological scripts that um, read as normative? Hmm. Um, how much of that um, gets figured into that process of sense making and what's um, what it's possible to say, right? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, hmm, I feel my answer is going to be a little less sophisticated. I, I am only interested in making, I think the reason why I write is to try to make temporary sense of things that don't make sense to me about myself or the world I pass through. So I never, it never occurs to me to think about an audience. Um, and I sometimes feel like, um, well, I don't know. I don't want to say which is a better way or not, but because we just do it the way we do it. Um, but for me, the point, what I want from poetry as a reader is to be shown the world that I thought I knew in a world, in a way that makes me totally rethink what I assumed was true. And so that can only happen if someone doesn't take into account what I'm coming to the page with, what I'm thinking, but, but sort of surprises me and maybe upsets me by presenting a very different way of approaching something. Um, so I'm grateful for that in poetry. One of the problems, my, my, um, my students know, I say very often, how 90% of what is considered to be poetry is not poetry and is not of interest to me. And then they get all scared and I realize, maybe I shouldn't say that to them. Um, <laughs> but, but I want them to understand the truths of this world, it's hard. Um, but the reason why most poetry is dissatisfying to me is because it merely shows me what I already know. And in nothing, it doesn't surprise me with anything weird, strange, a different approach. And so I question, I always think, why did someone feel they had to write this? It's simply transcribing life as we already understand it. But for me, and here I'm quoting a poet, Ellen Bryant Voigt, she talked a lot about how um, poetry is not about the transcription of experience, but the transformation of it. And so I'm interested in that. I want, I want that as a reader to be transformed. And so in my own poems, I'm really just trying to wrestle with things the way I see them. And I'm a, I wasn't aware when I first started out, I didn't understand why people reacted strangely in audiences when I read. They, some would leave in anger, some thought I was shocking and, I don't know, problematic. Um, because I thought, doesn't everyone think about this? Doesn't everyone talk about sex? Doesn't everyone talk about sex in this way? Uh, apparently not. And apparently they don't like to or they're afraid or something. And but, and if I thought ahead about that, I wouldn't have written the poems maybe. I think it would have held me back. It seems like bold, vote, like people always say, Carl, you're brave. I'm not, I'm, I'm simply like trapped in my own head and it never occurs to me that anyone thinks differently. So there's, the good side is like, I guess maybe it, I say something that's different, but, but then I seem to shock people a lot and I don't mean to. That's why I stay home because I know when I leave the house, <laughs> all hell breaks loose. Sorry, that was a rambling answer to the question, but I got there. Hmm. Yes, hello. Yes. What I'm reading now? Hmm. I just read, I said to my partner last night, I think I've read the best novel I've read in decades. And it's a first novel by a woman named Rosalind Brown called Practice. 
that has just come out in England. It's not out here yet. And I think in a few months it will be. Which, strangely enough, is English professors will like this. It's 200 pages of this undergraduate woman at Oxford trying to write her paper on Shakespeare's sonnets. And everything that happens in the course of that day, and each chapter is like one page. And, and it seems like, how could this be interesting? But, um, but it's fascinating. And you don't have to know the sonnets, but if you do, it's fantastic. And, um, and if you're like me, where you live with the sonnets and read them like practically every day, then it's amazing, because this is what this, this woman does. And half her thoughts are Shakespeare's thoughts, or quotes from Shakespeare. So that was the most recent one. And um, yes, and then I've just started a novel just this morning by um, someone who's here in the audience, um, Rombo. <coughs> um, sorry, I just met you. What, what is your name? Esther, Esther, yes, sorry. We just met the other day, and then I was inspired. I went and Googled you, and then I heard about this book, and then I saw that it was in the Fitzcarraldo editions, which I'm addicted to, so it was a, so those are, that's what I'm reading most recently. Looking forward to it. Yes, hi. Yeah. Oh, I was just trying to think, what did I say? Um, but that's what I said. I mean, it sounds like something I would say. I'm, I'm pretty, oh yeah, that, yeah. Right. I know. I, I badmouth academia so much for someone who's been here a long time. Um, I'm just so, you know, I value and like my colleagues, I do. I just, I didn't, I didn't get trained that way. And so, so I don't know how to, when I came here, I, basically I was a high school teacher and I started, and they threw me into a classroom and, and I spent a few years thinking I was just too stupid to be a real professor. It took me a while, once I started getting to know the professors better, and I thought, they're not that smart. <laughs> they, they know a very sliver. They're, like, I'd, even, I'd say to some, some teacher, I'd say, you know, this George Herbert poem, they'd say, oh, I only do Chaucer. And I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, so very narrow, you know, so, but also, well, yeah, and, and maybe everyone feels this thing, and so, so that's all, it's more like, so I'm not able to, sometimes I won't, um, I, I feel like I don't have the intellectual background or the theoretical the background in theory. Like students will say, oh, what do you think about the Lacanian view of this? It's like, I don't know who that, I don't, I don't know. So, so, I'm, so in that sense, what I'm interested in is we look at poems and what's on the page? You know, I'm not as interested in like, well, what does this, what does this letter make you think of, you know? And I, I mean, I've learned that maybe that's to do with something called post-structuralism, but I don't know what it is. I tried. And so, so it's not that my way is better or worse. It's more like I'm just, that's the only way I know how to read poems is just reading them over and over again. Like when I look at Shakespeare's sonnets, I have to remind myself sometimes, once these were written and people who were not scholars read them, so they have to have they have to be able to yield meaning, and then it's great if you've also read a lot of books about them and everything. But but sometimes I feel like oh you know maybe we can just live with the poems and we don't have to think what does this expert say or what does this theorist say. But you know it's not shutting down everything that everyone else does. It's really not. He said, <laughs> trying not to seem dismissive, but I love you all. Yes. You want me to sit down? Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. So...
Thank you, thank you so much, Carl, for this deep, thought-provoking, poetic, insightful. I wish I could write a poem about presentation. Your presentation. So there's a reception out there. Please join us for the reception.